everybody out there. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Doug Rett. I'm an optometrist at the Boston VA, Boston, Massachusetts. It is nine o'clock in the morning here on Friday. Uh, and I was happy to see so many people from around the world uh, tuning into this. So it's, uh, I hope it'll be an interesting talk. When I thought about, um, when I was asked to, to speak, I thought about uh, what we could talk about. I wanted to do something that everybody could identify with and everybody could, could use. And I thought, what would be more global than herpes? <laughs> uh, herpes is in every country where humans are. It's a globally ubiquitous virus uh, where humans are the only reservoir. So I thought it'd be important for us to, to talk about. Uh, the audience is kind of varied here, right? So I hope I don't speak uh, above some of you or below some of you. The lecture set up as a review, and then we'll get into some new things that have changed about uh, herpes in the last uh, generation. This whole talk came about because I was uh, interested in uh, what's changed lately in herpes. In America, we've been vaccinating our children for chickenpox, for varicella zoster virus, over the last, say, generation. And over the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been vaccinating our adults against shingles. So the question came to mind uh, how this would change the way we see herpetic eye disease in the clinic, if we see it at an earlier age or a younger age, or if the numbers go up or down. So we'll get into some of that. The lecture setup uh, that will start with varicella zoster virus and then transition to talk about herpes zoster virus and shingles, then talk about the ocular infestations of those uh, things, and then we'll talk about herpetic uh, simplex virus and the ocular ramifications of that. But it brings us to our first poll question. How comfortable are you with managing herpetic eye disease? So we have a, a varied audience, like we talked about before, and there's hundreds of people uh, listening right now. Some of us are experienced clinicians that have been treating herpes for years, and then some of us uh, are students just starting off. So just kind of wanted to get an idea of where people were in their level of managing herpetic eye disease. So go ahead and click on the question and then hit submit. We'll wait a little bit uh, for all the responses to come through. Slightly comfortable, but need to know more. Well, that's a nice level to be at. Uh, uh, there's always room for improvement, right? Um, so we all have something to, to learn. And I think, um, I think it'll be a nice review for everyone and um, we'll get into some of the new things. So let's get right at it. If you've ever listened to, to me speak or read anything that I've written, you know I like to talk about the etymology of, of uh, the words that we talk about when we're talking about certain diseases. And if you've read uh, the chapter in any cornea textbook about herpetic eye disease, it always starts, it seems to be mandatory that you start the chapter by uh, mentioning that Hippocrates was the first to describe herpes. Uh, and herpes is, is Greek for crawling or spreading. And if you think about the way this rash spreads on the skin, it's a very fitting word. Uh, what I didn't know uh, was the word zoster is also a Greek word, which means belt. But not so much the belt or a girdle that you wear around your waist to keep your pants up, but more like this that you can see uh, on the right-hand side here that would be worn, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but be worn like over the torso or like around the shoulder. Um, in Greek society, and, and certain uh, uh, people had different colored zosters, and warriors were also often given the red color zoster. If you think about this, this picture on the bottom about what a typical zoster rash looks like, you can imagine how it would kind of look like this zoster belt, right? Especially if it was red, this rash going around your torso in this unique to one dermatome fashion. Varicella is Latin. Uh, for pac, and that makes sense, right? Uh, and then simplex is also Latin, meaning like singular or simple. And that uh, seems a little bit uh, confusing, uh, except when you think about it in contrast to zoster, whereas this chicken pox rash over your entire face and something over your entire body, um, a simplex outbreak is much more focal and, and localized, right? So it's just a little bit more singular. That's where we get these terms from. We'll jump into varicella zoster virus. I'll transition sometimes between chicken pox and varicella zoster virus. We mean the same thing. This is the primary infection uh, in, in zoster virus, right? And then when we refer to herpes zoster virus, 
we're referring to shingles, we're referring to the reactivation of that latent varicella zoster virus. As most of us know, chickenpox is highly contagious. It's spread via respiratory transmission, um, so it's less direct contact. Uh, so if you're touching these pox and then touching your skin, it's less of a big deal as the respiratory transmission. Most cases, as most of us know, are children uh, age five to nine. The typical course, if you don't remember when you had chicken pox or when the child around you had chicken pox, um, is one to four days of kind of like these prodromal, low-grade fever and malaise type symptoms. And then you'll start to see the rash. And the rash starts uh, as a papillary rash. It's kind of flat uh, and a little bit strange looking. And then a day later, you'll see this classic vesicular uh, or pock like uh, rash. And these vesicles lash, last uh, for about four days. So the whole thing lasts about a week, give or take. The child will complain about um, a skin itch and this overall feeling of unwell, um, but less severe pain that you'll see in adults. Um, besides this, the viral skin infection, the most common complication in youth is a bacterial super infection. So the skin is broken from a viral infection, right? And that uh, leaves it susceptible uh, to a bacterial infection. This is why you'll see some people, uh, when they have a dramatic chicken pox infection, it's a super infection from bacteria and can leave those pox scars that last into adulthood. That's when the bacteria can penetrate the basement membrane of the epidermis and get into the dermis and cause scarring. So that's in youth and the most common complication in adults is pneumonia, and that's why an infection of varicella zoster virus when you're an adult is much more serious. And we'll talk about that. Um, that was varicella zoster virus. Now talking about herpes uh, zoster virus. This is a reactivation of latent uh, varicella zoster virus. So as, as we probably know, whenever we get this varicella zoster infection, it's in our sensory nerves, right? Not our motor nerves, but our sensory nerves. It comes out uh, the nerve endings in the skin, um, and then when the virus subsides, it doesn't leave the nerves, right? It, it uh, retreats down uh, the sensory nerves into the sensory ganglia. It can happen at any age, this, this reactivation of our old chickenpox virus, but it typically happens over 50 years old. Uh, we're getting older, our immune system is slowing down a little bit, and it's been a while since we were exposed to the original virus and our titers are reducing, right? And so that's why you can get it at any age. We've all seen friends and, and family who, who have a zoster rash in their 20s or 30s, but it's typically over 50 years old. You usually, if you have a normal immune system, will only get this reactivation. You'll only get this shingles outbreak once in your life. Immunocompromised patients um, can get it more often though, but recurrent zoster is, is unusual in an in a immunocompetent, in immunocompetent patient. It doesn't necessarily uh, mean that you were recently exposed to chickenpox. Say you had uh, chickenpox as a child and now you're an adult caring for a child with chickenpox. You don't necessarily have to worry about an outbreak of shingles because you're exposed to this child. It's not thought to be related. The outbreak in shingles is more related, and uh, we'll talk about later, is certain stressors, like obviously stress, uh, sunlight, fever, um, things like that. Just like chickenpox, the rash and shingles starts off as erythematous flat papules uh, and then turns into grouped vesicles. It's usually limited to one dermatome, just like we talked about in the beginning with that zoster belt uh, around your uh, waist. The thorax area, and you can see on the picture uh, on the bottom, is the most common uh, area to be affected uh, by shingles. Uh, and that's why as eye care providers, we don't necessarily see most of these, the, up to 40% of all shingles rashes happen in your thorax and abdomen. But the second most common um, is the V1 distribution of the trigeminal nerve. When you get shingles, uh, as opposed to chickenpox, pain is the number one symptom here. And it's often described as a, as a sharp, burning, stabbing, throbbing nerve type of pain. And sometimes can be prodromal, right? The patient will come in and say, I have this, this pain in my forehead, a pain in my eyelid. And, and you do an exam and you palpate and you can't find anything. Keep shingles on, on your list because this might be prodromal pain before you actually see the rash. And then when you're talking about shingles, um, the conversation usually goes to post neuralgia. 
This is the most common complication uh, of shingles. Uh, it refers to pain that persists beyond four months from the onset uh, of shingles, right? And uh, the adjective used in almost all of the texts when you're describing post-traumatic neuralgia is exquisitely painful. Uh, if you think about uh, the stats of, of shingles, one in three human beings will get shingles in our lifetime. Uh, in 10 to 15% of every patient with shingles, gets post-herpetic neuralgia. So we're talking about a huge amount uh, of patients in our lifetime that will get post-herpetic neuralgia. This complication is the main reason that these vaccines for shingles exist. Half of patients with post-herpetic neuralgia are patients over 60. Again, as we get older, our immune system is waning uh, and less able to, to fight this back. It results in a reduced quality of life, uh, physically and psychologically. And it brings us to our second poll question. Which branch of the trigeminal nerve is most affected by herpes zoster? V1 uh, is the ophthalmic branch. Again, we're talking about the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve. V1 is the ophthalmic branch. V2 is the maxillary branch. V3 is the mandibular branch. Uh, and then V4 doesn't exist. <laughs> so don't choose four. Yes, very well. Uh, nice job. Nice job. Uh, V2, the most commonly affected branch in herpes zoster. So we talked about the thoracic area as being the most common part of your body, but uh, the face, uh, and specifically the first branch of the trigeminal nerve, is the second most common, and that's what we care about uh, in the eye. Move this over. So there's three branches of the trigeminal nerve, right, just like we talked about, but then somewhat confusingly, there's three branches of the first branch. So this is the frontal branch, um, which provides, uh, supplies your forehead. The lacrimal uh, branch, which obviously innervates the lacrimal gland. And then the nasociliary branch, which innervates the globe, the ethmoid sinus, uh, a lot of the lids. And that's what we care about as eye care providers. So the most affected branch of the first branch of the trigeminal nerve is the frontal nerve. Uh, and that's what you can see from this. I'll move my mouse around to see if you can, I uh, hope you can see it. This um, poor lady has uh, pretty bad shingles, right? And, but you can really tell her distribution of her nerves. I'm circling the frontal distribution, which is this nasty rash on her forehead. And then here, nicely uh, delineated, is uh, a mapping of the nasal ciliary branch. Uh, and you can see she has ocular involvement. Her conjunctiva is very injected. Um, so again, frontal, low, frontal branch uh, most affected. Nasal ciliary is the one we care about the most. When we talk about uh, new, new changes in, in her, the way we manage herpetic eye disease, we're taught about Hutchinson sign, right? And the way I learned it is a lesion on the tip of the nose, like she has here, is Hutchinson sign. And you're concerned about globe involvement, or you should assume that there is globe involvement if you see a lesion on the tip of the nose. Now the literature is more pointing towards the new Hutchinson sign is a lesion on the side of the nose, specifically um, towards the bridge here. This is the kind of epicenter, and you can see this is her worst uh, part of her rash, is right where the nasal ciliary nerve kind of uh, comes out of the skin. Um, and so just because you don't see a lesion on the tip of the nose doesn't mean you're safe. Anywhere, frankly, a lesion anywhere on the nose, and you think that the nasal ciliary nerve is involved, and you should really triple check for globe involvement. What does globe involvement look like? It is typically just vesicles on the eyelid and a nonspecific conjunctivitis. Um, but you can have uh, lesions anywhere in the eye. We're going to stay away from uh, things like uh, retinitis and, and uveitis. We're going to focus more on uh, corneal complications. But suffice it to say, the, the eyelids and the conjunctiva uh, and the cornea are the most commonly affected in, in zoster ophthalmicus. So we refer to herpes zoster ophthalmicus when it's just in the first branch of the trigeminal nerve. That means you can have HZO if you just have forehead lesions. Oftentimes we'll see patients sent up from the emergency room with a, a forehead uh, rash that they think is, is HCO and they want to clear the eye. So it's your job as an eye care provider um, when you see a patient with a forehead rash uh, to make sure there's, there's no globe involvement. We say 10 to 20% of all shingles involves the uh, ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Here's an interesting, uh, interesting case that I found on the web. This lady was nice enough to post her shingles uh, saga, 
uh, as it went on. Uh, and she posted it um, in the hopes of, of getting people with early shingles rashes to identify it themselves and head to the doctor because she didn't do that. Uh, and her case ended up pretty bad. Here's day one. Um, she takes a picture of herself and describes her symptoms with a headache and a skin itch. We can't see the left side of her forehead uh, in this picture, um, but you kind of assume if we're talking about zoster that it's spared. But notice her rash is, is kind of papillary and flat. Um, her eye seems okay, right? And her symptoms are itch, but on day two, she describes excruciating skin pain. The rash has changed a little bit. It's become a little bit more localized, right? Um, and I think you can see, if I get my mouse, a, um, some vesicles uh, here forming there. Whereas the, the rash on day one is very flat and broad, and now we're kind of firming up. And perhaps a little crocodile tear here. Day four, things have unfortunately gotten a lot worse for her. The rash is obviously vesicular and looks very herpetic in my opinion. Um, the eyelid is quite swollen. She describes the pain as burning, uh, which would be horrible, uh, I think. Uh, she's posted pictures all day, but I'll just skip to the end. Uh, is day seven. Her, her eye is, is quite involved, you can see. She says that now she's been to three specialists uh, just in these first seven days and has retinal involvement, uveal involvement, and then obviously conge and corneal involvement. The rash is starting to, to dry up a little bit, obviously, but the, the virus is still in the eye. She ended up with a, a bad case of acute retinal necrosis and has good central vision, but has lost a lot of her peripheral vision. This is kind of how um, the rash changes. When we're worried about the cornea, um, the most common corneal uh, involvement in, in zoster ophthalmicus is just some simple punctate epithelial erosions. They kind of coalesce together uh, over time and can form pseudodendrites. When I think of corneal involvement in zoster, I think of this phrase pseudodendrites that you learn in school. It's always a bit confusing, right? Is it a dendrite? Is it a pseudodendrite? All pseudodendrites really mean is a, a, a collection of uh, PEEs that have kind of come together. And then there's heaped epithelial cells on top of that. Those heaped epithel epithelial cells are kind of devitalized, right? Just like you might see in, in a corneal abrasion that's healing, uh, these kind of like heaped up cells on top. And so they'll look linear, uh, like you see in the, in the picture there, uh, but they stain very minimally as opposed to like a true dendrite. A true dendrite is one that's going to like erode tissue and, and kill these epithelial cells and then uh, possibly burrow into uh, Bowman's membrane and, and into the anterior stroma. That doesn't happen in a pseudodendrite. And then classically, they don't have end bulbs. They're just kind of like these linear lines uh, where the PEEs have just kind of coalesced together. You can also get this numular keratitis, right? This is the picture on the right-hand side. Numular from the term like numismatist, like coin, right? Like a coin collector. This numular keratitis is essentially just uh, uh, sub-epithelial infiltrates, right? Like the, the, the nerve endings have protruded into the epithelial cells and you get these PEEs in the epithelium. That infection in the epithelial cells creates a localized uh, inflammation just under the epithelial cells in the uh, anterior stroma. So this is this numular keratitis, which is just the same uh, as before, but it's just like a localized reaction under it. Then you can also get, like this picture on the left, a bad keratic precipitates, bad uveitis, discoform keratitis, retinitis. We'll talk a lot about these when we talk about herpetic keratitis because the present uh, herpes simplex keratitis because the presentation is somewhat similar. So how do we manage zoster? We try and prevent it. We try and slow it down. Um, a lot of us think about chickenpox as kind of a benign childhood rite of passage. And for most of us, fortunately, it is. Um, but in the 1980s in America, there was 3 million cases of, of chickenpox each year, but it resulted in 11,000 hospitalizations and 100 deaths, which 100 deaths out of 3 million cases, I guess, is a relatively good um, ratio. But if that's your child or if that's your grandchild, that's a lot more serious of a case. If you have immunocompromised or HIV, um, or if you're just a kid taking steroids for your asthma, your chance of, of hospitalization and death is much higher. If you are an adult, you have a 40 times higher risk uh, of death than if you're a child. 
again, uh, more susceptible to pneumonia from that, and our immune systems are not as good as when we're a child. But then you have the unfortunate case of perinatal varicella infection, right? This is where the pregnant mother gets infection with chickenpox uh, right before they give birth, transmits um, to the child uh, during birth, and the mortality rate from that is, is quite high. So if we could prevent this, um, is the best treatment for this disease. There's um, morbidity mortality from shingles, right? Perhaps not quite as, as bad as chickenpox, but there's a um, study from the National Health in, in Britain said that shingles is responsible for average of 12 days missed work when people get a shingles infection. Presumably a lot of that is because of a skin rash that you just don't want to go outside for and just in so much pain for. And then there's post neuralgia, right, which is on average responsible for 12 days of hospitalization. Um, and is unfortunately the most common cause of suicide in patients with chronic pain over 70 years old. Uh, so it's a sad case and something that um, we're trying to prevent. In America, we started vaccinating our children for chickenpox in 1995. The first dose was uh, an intramuscular injection that's just given once. Uh, it was found to be 80% effective in preventing any kind of, of varicella infection at all and then 95% infected, effective in preventing uh, any hospitalizations uh, based on that. But then a couple of years later, we switched to combining that vaccine with the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Uh, and that was dosed twice when the child was around one year old and then around five years old. Uh, and that was found to be much more effective, 95% effective in preventing any varicella zoster infection. <clears throat> so the, the Best numbers that I could find were from 2014, and they compared uh, the numbers of varicella infections in 2014 uh, versus the early 90s, where, we, uh, where it was before we started vaccinating children. They found that 95% of adolescents in America had received one dose of the chickenpox vaccine, and 81% of them had received two doses. So it's pretty good. Room for improvement, but pretty good. Uh, and then you compare those numbers to the early 90s, varicella deaths had declined by 87% and hospitalizations had declined by 93%. Um, so solid numbers. Um, solid numbers. That was chickenpox vaccines. Now shingles vaccination has been happening in America for about 12 years. The first vaccine uh, was called Zostavax. It was by Merck and it was a live vaccine. And then just about a year ago, uh, almost to the day, Shingrex came out in America, um, and this is a recombinant vaccine. They both work by boosting the cell-mediated immune response, um, talking about T cells. If, if you look at uh, the uh, average American over 50 years old, 40% of us have zero titers. These are people who had chickenpox infections as a child. 40% of us have zero titers uh, to varicella zoster. So this is why we're getting uh, shingles. Which leads us to poll question number three. Around what year did the first major herpes zoster vaccine become available? Uh, in America, this is 86, 96, 2006, or 2016. Mm -hmm. so we've been doing chicken pox vaccinations uh, since about 1995. And the question is, when did we start doing shingles vaccination? 1996, the actual answer is 2006. Um, so we've been vaccinating chickenpox a lot longer than we've been vaccinating shingles. One of the things that, um, that, uh, that people wonder about, and one of the things that, that I wondered about, um, is, is the rate of shingles increasing now that we're vaccinating our children for chickenpox? right? Uh, are adults and, and parents and grandparents not being exposed to the chickenpox virus when they're raising these, these children, and then therefore not getting a tighter boost, um, and then therefore getting shingles at an earlier age, or perhaps more aggressive shingles with post neuropathy? And the answer is essentially no. They, they don't think that a shingles outbreak is caused by the vaccination to chickenpox, but confusingly, Shingles uh, outbreaks are on the rise uh, in America and across the, the globe. The reason, though, they don't think that um, shingles uh, increases related to chickenpox vaccine um, is because 
in, in countries that uh, don't vaccinate their children from chicken pox, they still have seen uh, an increase in shingles vaccination. And in America that, that does vaccinate children against chicken pox, they've seen uh, an increase in shingles outbreaks even before the vaccination happened. So shingles outbreaks are on the rise. The CDC uh, in America is somewhat um, confused about why, but they don't think it's related to chicken pox vaccine. Talking back about um, uh, shingles vaccination, Zostavax was the first one that came out in 2006, uh, hence the poll answer. This was an intramuscular injection that just needed one dose, uh, and the uh, CDC recommended this be done in all patients over 60 years old. But then a year ago, when Shingrix came out, um, the CDC changed the recommendations and now recommend uh, all adults uh, over 50 years old get the Shingrex vaccination. This is a two-dose vaccination. The dose is spread out by at least four to six months. Um, one of the reasons that they recommend Shingrex uh, to people over 50, and then the other one was recommended over 60, is that one, Shingrex works a lot better, and it works a lot longer. In one trial, they, in the Shingrex trial, they did a study with 15,000 uh, patients in America over 50 were given Shingrex, after three years, it prevented uh, shingles in 90% of patients compared to placebo, and then 90% effective against post-herpetic neuralgia. As far as the duration of immunity benefits, Zostavax uh, showed less than 50% efficacy after five years, and then no efficacy after eight years. And so that's one of the reasons why they recommended it in people who are a little bit older, because they knew that after five to eight years, it wasn't going to be effective anymore. And you compare that to Shingrex, uh, it's just come out, so they've been studying it. They have long-term data for four years, but they found almost no waning immunity um, in Shingrex. And I, I leave the, the zoster part um, with this, this last little icon that says, do your part. Um, in the sobering stat, I think that one in three of us humans will get shingles sometime in our lifetime. And we, as eye care providers, see a lot of complications from the uh, zoster virus in the eye. And we talk to our patients all the time about uh, systemic eye diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol. Um, why not also talk to them about uh, getting their zoster vaccination? Um, I think it's something that we can do a small part um, to help uh, these patients. Okay, that was herpes zoster and varicella zoster. We transition to herpes simplex. Hope you're saving some, some questions at the end. We'll have some time at the end. I thought maybe we would just um, bang through the whole lecture and then take questions at the end. Okay, most of us know herpes simplex virus has two parts, one and two. Um, herpes virus one uh, is the one that affects the eye uh, and the lips and cold sores, et cetera. And then two is mostly genitals. There's a new terminology uh, for this. Uh, you may have heard in literature, human herpes virus one, human herpes virus two. This is just the same thing as, as simplex virus. Um, it's just that now they're categorizing all the herpes viruses with the same name. So human herpes virus three is varicella zoster, four is Epstein-Barr, and five, human herpes virus five is CMV. It keeps going, but those are the, the main ones for the eye. So zoster virus, uh, varicella zoster was spread by uh, usually respiratory transmission. The uh, simplex is almost always spread by direct transmission, right? Uh, kissing people or, or water bottles or something like that. Um, and then just like varicella zoster virus, develops a latency in the sensory nerves, right? Not the motor nerves, but the sensory nerves. Um, and then after the infection erupts, it um, travels retrograde back to the sensory ganglia. This is your uh, classic picture of a cold sore, close up, which is kind of gross. I hope um, no one's eating right now. Classic triggers, these are called fever blisters in some parts of this country, cold sores, lots of uh, colloquialisms for them. Uh, they're triggered by stress, uh, but then also fever, sunlight, uh, and hormonal changes. Much more localized uh, than the zoster rashes are, hence the name simplex, like we talked about. By the time we're 40, 90% of humans uh, will have antibodies to herpes zoster virus, right? This is a ubiquitous thing. Now, speaking of just the keratitis, uh, 
um, when you get corneal involvement uh, from herpes simplex, 90% of the time, this is a unilateral phenomenon. Uh, and you will get recurrences of this disease. The recurrences, um, thankfully, almost always affect the same eye. So you're not going to get bilateral. Um, you're, you won't often get bilateral blindness from this. But just like we talked about zoster um, recurring very rarely, simplex recurs very frequently. After 10 years after your first uh, simplex keratitis, you have a 67% chance of having a recurrence. So it's likely uh, within a decade that it will recur. And these patients, um, once you diagnose simplex keratitis, you need to follow them, them closely and stay with them. Hmm. Okay, uh, what happens and why does it happen uh, in simplex keratitis? Um, you have essentially three problems. Uh, you have an active infection of the virus um, infecting a certain, amount, a certain part of the corneal tissue. And you can have an active infection on all three layers of the cornea, right? So when you're, when you're talking about simplex keratitis, it's not as simple as just, uh, as just um, looking for a dendrite in the epithelium. You can have an active infection in the epithelium. Um, and then classically, you can have uh, an inflammation in adjacent tissues. So the uh, example here is an active infection in the corneal and epithelium and then adjacent inflammation in the corneal stroma, right? So when, you, when you're looking at uh, a patient with herpetic eye disease, try and think about is this active infection or is this recurrent inflammation that's active? So one, active infection, two, adjacent inflammation, or three, an immune reaction from a past infection. There's no obvious uh, infection in the cornea. This is just all inflammatory, delayed type hypersensitivity. Right? A bit confusing. Uh, the diagnosis of, of simplex is typically made by uh, clinical appearance alone. Right? You could do blood work on these patients, but almost every human being is going to test positive for it, so it's not helpful. You can culture these lesions. Um, in my experience, this, this doesn't work uh, that well unless the... Uh, corneal lesion is, is quite large, right? And then maybe you can get enough sample um, to get a good culture, but uh, especially when it's like a small dendrite, it usually uh, doesn't work nearly as well as you'd hope for. And the cultures take at least one to two days to come back if you're in a clinical hospital. Um, generally, uh, the best case here is just to diagnose it based on appearance alone. And keep in mind, and keep uh, simplex keratitis on your differential. A lot of these pictures that we're about to show have um, very uh, close similarities to other conditions, right? And you think you're following a bacterial ulcer, and then you realize it's a simplex, um, it's a necrotizing stromal keratitis. Always keep in mind um, herpetic keratitis and a differential. All right, so we're gonna talk about how simplex affects the epithelium, the stroma, the endo, and then the fourth category that doesn't really fit, as well as neurotropic keratitis. And again, know that it can affect every layer of the eye, right? We're just going to focus um, on the cornea today. So, number one, epithelial keratitis. This is the most frequent form of simplex keratitis. It's basically a, a dendrite or a geographic ulcer, right? And we all know the, the, the look of the dendrite. If this is, uh, but we all know the look of the dendrite, but you can also get these larger dendrites that they call geographic ulcers. If you don't treat uh, an epithelial simplex keratitis, the, the dendrite and the whole disease will last about 17 days. Um, but when it recurs, it lasts a lot longer, up to a month. The symptoms uh, of epithelial disease, is photophobia, your, cl your classic like corneal problems, right? Photophobia, pain, watery discharge. The pain is not too intense though. Typically, I mean, depends on how big the dendrite is, but it's typically like more of a foreign body sensation or a small pain. So what you'll see, if you see the patient early enough, which is rare, but you'll see these small punctate epithelial erosions, and they kind of like coalesce to form vesicles in the epithelium that look a lot like the vesicles around your lips. But this is like the first 24 hours, and the patient often doesn't show up there. But those vesicles then coalesce uh, to form uh, the classic dendrite, and this is in the second 24 hours of the eruption. And that's typically when the patient gets a little bit more pain, they realize it's not going away, and then they come in to clinic to see you. Uh, so a dendrite is a true ulcer in that it extends through the basement membrane, or at least has the potential to extend through the basement membrane. So the potential for scarring here is a lot more serious. 
which is why we take the simplex uh, dendrites a lot more seriously than we do the zoster pseudodendrites, because we know that the potential for scarring in the zoster pseudodendrite is very low. So here's some pictures. We've all probably seen these pictures. I think the one on the left is, is kind of cool looking um, and also like you can see it a little bit better without the fluorescein. So dendron uh, is the Greek word for tree. And you can uh, imagine how it gets this term, right? This arborizing, branching um, pattern of it. When I was in school, they, they taught you that um, a dendrite, the middle part will stain with fluorescein because the epithelial cells are broken and, and gone and eroded. And then the end bulbs stain with rosemary gall. I think clinically uh, in the real world, this is less important. It's hard for me to get rosemary gall in my clinic. Uh, we haven't had any in a while. Um, but the reason that that was taught is because the, the end bulbs contain the active virus and they are in the process of destroying the epithelial cells but might not have broken through yet. Uh, and then eventually those, the virus will break through and continue on. And so the fluorescein staining happens when the epithelium is broken from the beginning part of the dendrite, um, but not yet at the end bulbs of the dendrite. Next, oh, let's go through two. Um, then you can get this thing called dendrite epitheliopathy, uh, which is kind of looking like ghost dendrites, right? Uh, and this is just abnormal epithelium that persist, persists weeks after the dendrite has healed. It's just basically swollen epithelial cells deter, detergesting after the infection. And sometimes people think that maybe the, the topical antivirals that you may have given play a role in kind of like retaining those cells, but they'll eventually go away, uh, usually about a week later. So that's uh, the regular dendrite, and then you can get this geographic epithelial simplex keratitis, which is basically just a really big dendrite. Um, but this is 22% of all epithelial involvement turns out to be a geographic um, ulcer, uh, which obviously is worse symptoms, takes longer to heal, and something that you want to avoid. There's a bit of controversy in the literature, um, but some people think that this might be associated with use of steroids, right? So if you accidentally give uh, or mistakenly give uh, steroids early on in the course of epithelial simplex keratitis, perhaps you, the patient has more of a risk of, of developing a geographic ulcer. So this one is kind of obviously like a den dendroform, right? But you can imagine how you might uh, see uh, a patient with uh, a geographic simplex also that is a little bit more circular and you think you're just dealing with a, a regular, say, corneal abrasion or, or a regular uh, bacterial ulcer. So again, always keep uh, simplex in mind when you're talking about differential diagnosis. That was epithelial simplex keratitis. This is stromal simplex keratitis. This is uh, poorly categorized in the past, and they've changed. This is another thing that's new in herpetic eye disease, is the changing of the nomenclature with stromal simplex keratitis. It used to be called discoform keratitis. Now they're breaking stromal involvement into two terms, an active infection in stromal disease, which is necrotizing stromal keratitis, and then a reactivation, inflammatory reaction of stromal disease, which is just called immune stromal keratitis. Right, um, so a primary stromal infection is pretty rare. It's just 2% of simplex keratitis is the necrotizing active infection type. But the stroma gets inflamed all the time, whether it's uh, adjacent inflammation from epithelial disease or endothelial disease, or just a reactivation of the disease that happens to be in the sperm. And so you have to think about um, the cause because that would change your treatment, right? Whether it's infectious or inflammatory. So the first one is the infectious one. Like I said, this is the most rare uh, type, but it's the worst type. Uh, you'll see a dense infiltrate in the stroma and then broken epithelium uh, over top of it. But that could also describe a microbial keratitis, right? The, the big difference between the viral versus bacterial etiology is that the viral keratitis uh, moves much quicker. You'll see uh, advanced stromal thinning and can lead to perforation very quickly. Here's a picture of it, looks pretty nasty. You see the really large stromal infiltrate and the broken uh, epithelium over top of it. This patient needs um, heavy antiviral treatment um, and very close care uh, because the risk of perforation um, is strong here. But could mimic a bacterial keratitis, right? 
The second type of stromal involvement is the immune reaction, right? Otherwise known as interstitial keratitis. This is almost always a recurrence of herpetic simplex keratitis. And classically, they have epithelial uh, keratitis, and then weeks or, or even years later, they have this reactivation of the disease, but it's not in the epithelium, it's in the stroma. And it's 20% of all simplex keratitis is this stromal reactivation. It's a cell-mediated delayed type hypersensitivity to the viral antigens in the cornea. So this, as opposed to the necrotizing type, is you'll see intact epithelium, but you'll still see that stromal infiltrate, right? And then classically, you see the stromal neovascularization that you think of when you think of interstitial keratitis. And this is under the epithelium, this branching, arborizing neovascularization um, that is really um, quite rare. And when you see interstitial keratitis, herpes simplex reactivation is, is high on your list. So this is bad, right? Because this neovascularization will bring uh, a lipid exudate and bring uh, scarring into the cornea, um, but it'll also compromise the immune privilege of the cornea, right? And make a, the potential and the prognosis for a future corneal graft a lot worse. Something that you want to avoid. So we talked about epithelial disease, stromal disease, and now endothelial disease. <clears throat> this is not a, typically a true infection, uh, but an inflammatory reaction at the level of the um, endothelium. You can see on the picture here, this um, corneal haze and corneal edema, um, but you can see these keratic precipitates on the endothelium. And this is what you're looking for. It's often discoform in shape, uh, which I didn't include a picture of, but you can kind of imagine on this picture, especially on the bottom of the cornea, you can see this classic circle uh, of the discoform keratitis starting. Um, so this is, is not in the stroma. I mean, sometimes the scarring can reach the stroma, but it starts on the endothelium. Um, they're trying to get away from this term discoform keratitis because it's not very descriptive. It just means that um, it's circle shaped. Um, um, so try and refer to this as endotheliitis. It's fun to spell because there's like three out of four letters or I's in a row. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes with this classic uh, uveitis, um, which is pathognomonic in its high intraocular pressure, uh, right? Typically when you see a uveitis, the pressure is the same or maybe a little bit lower because it's the, the ciliary body is inflamed. Um, but in a viral etiology of uveitis, the intraocular pressure is higher. And I think that's due to a secondary trabeculitis or, or maybe those chronic precipitates that are in the anterior chamber um, getting logged. Uh, yeah, uh, logged into the trabecular meshwork and just clogging it up. And then the fourth one is neurotrophic keratitis. I think of this as essentially a diabetic foot ulcer of the eye. If you think about when you have a diabetic foot ulcer, this like peripheral neuropathy, the nerves just start to die uh, and the cells that they use to innervate um, change also, right? So this isn't a, a, an inflammation or an infection. It's just this corneal virus has been living in these nerves for so long that eventually the nerves start to die. And then the cells that they innervate um, stop functioning. So you have hyposthesia or complete anesthesia uh, of the corneal nerve. And that's why it's always important to check um, corneal sensitivity in your patients with past or suspected herpetic disease. So when you lose this corneal innervation, you'll start to get, um, uh, the eye will start to dry out and you'll get these punctate epithelial erosions. Those will coalesce into uh, these, um, these kind of like uh, non-healing epithelial defects. Uh, and then you'll start to get this larger epithelial defect. So the eye is just drying out um, and the nerves aren't uh, sensing that the eye is dry and the eye isn't sending more tear. So you'll get these classic uh, erosions and ulcers, right? But they differ from your dendriform ulcer, right? Because of the, the shape of them, the borders of them. The neurotrophic ulcer is always gonna be relatively smooth borders and circular or oval as opposed to a, a dendri, right? Um, and it's simply because the, the eye is just drying out. Very hard to treat these, best to prevent them. Let's talk about um, simplex keratitis treatment. Most of the treatment that we talk about when we're talking about um, simplex keratitis was, um, was learned by the herpetic eye disease study. 
And this was a study that came out in the early 90s um, that was a multi-center study across the world um, that came out uh, with just tons and tons of literature. We don't have time to, to go into the herpetic eye disease study, but I encourage you to, to read it. When HEADS came out, the only topical treatment that we had for simplex keratitis was trifluoridine, baroptic. Uh, this was approved in 1980. Uh, and is not uh, that great of a drug anymore. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about today and encourage you guys to start using some of the new drugs. Uh, if you have epithelial uh, disease, you're dosing your patient like nine times a day with veroptic. And it's pretty toxic to the epithelium. So after you see a patient for several days, sometimes the epithelium will look even worse and you don't know if it's the virus or the cure. In 2009, in America, the FDA approved a gang cyclobeer, which is a gel as opposed to a solution of, of veroptic um, that is much easier on the epithelium and dosed much uh, less frequently. Do so you think that it helps compliance? That is gang cyclovir. There's also an acyclovir ointment. It's not available uh, in America, but it's used worldwide. Uh, that's very well tolerated. Um, so you have an ointment option in some countries, a gel option, uh, and then the old solution um, of veroptic. Which brings us to our last poll question. In 1988, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to the scientists whose research led to the discovery of which of these medications? And most of us did. Um, and you are correct, uh, except all of you are correct, right? It's a bit of a nasty trick question uh, because the answer is all of these drugs. Uh, Gertrude Elion and George Hitchens um, studied differences in DNA metabolism in the 40s and 50s. They were the first to find that um, normal human cells and cancer cells and then bacteria and viruses all metabolize DNA differently. And if you, would, uh, if you could identify a way to change that metabolism, you could change uh, and affect just some of those cells and not all of our cells. And so all of these drugs for cell rejection and viruses and bacteria and gout were all um, discovered by this research. So that drug, acyclovir, that won the Nobel Prize, um, was the only oral medication that we had in the head study. And it's not a great medication. It's poorly absorbed uh, in our stomach. The bioavailability is only 10 to 20% by the time it reaches the bloodstream. So it's, it's not a, a great drug because it doesn't reach our, our bloodstream very well, but it's nice that you don't have to worry about renal function. You can just kind of give it to everybody. But uh, in the last generation, there's a lot better antiviral drugs that have come out, and I encourage you to use them. Uh, there's Val acyclovir and it, that came out in 95, and then FAM cyclovir that came out about a decade later. The bioavailability of these drugs is much better, but because it's better, uh, you have to worry about kidney function. Um, so if you have a patient with kidney disease, perhaps consider acyclovir um, or uh, consider one of these newer drugs, um, but just renal titrate the dose. So it's dosed much less frequent, uh, so there's better uh, compliance and it's much more effective. So consider valet cyclovir and bam cyclovir. One of the other things that I was thinking um, when I was putting this talk together, uh, besides the question about vaccines, and beside the question um, about the treatment changes, uh, is what do we do about these procedures that we're doing on patients? LASIK, corneal cross-linking. We talked about um, one of the triggers of, of simplex uh, in all herpes really is sunlight exposure and what is corneal cross-linking except a lot of exposure to UV light. So I, it got me thinking, what um, should we be telling our patients who are interested in these procedures who have a history of, of simplex keratitis? And there have been reports of reactivation of herpetic simplex keratitis following these treatments of eczema laser, uh, microkeratome LASIK, and corneal cross-linking. And so the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends to give perioperative and postoperative antiviral therapy to all refractive surgery patients uh, with those undergoing those procedures with the history of simplex keratitis. And there's also topical prostaglandin therapy, right, typically for glaucoma. This is more controversial. Uh, there's less of a consensus on this. There's anecdotal reports of herpetic simplex keratitis worsening. Uh, that they think is attributed to um, topical prostaglandins, but um, there's really no large study correlation here. So the results are still out. All right, to sum up what we talked about, I think when you're, when you're managing herpetic eye disease, the key is to make a timely diagnosis. Don't, 
make one diagnosis and assume it's correct and, and see the patient back in, in two weeks. Bring the patient back quickly uh, because, uh, and bring the patient back soon and often because this virus can, can change quickly. And it's something that you want to stay on top of because of all the differential diagnoses that it could be. And think about uh, what we talked about vaccines and, and zoster uh, patients um, and the patients who seem at risk for it, perhaps monocular patients, um, perhaps immunocompromised patients. Talk to them about getting the vaccine. And when you're managing uh, any kind of herpetic keratitis, think about the new medicines, uh, gang cyclovir gel, acyclovir ointment, uh, and then the valley cyclovir and fam cyclovir um, oral medication. All right, that's all I have. Um, I figure we'll uh, pop it over to the questions. Please log on. You can see up top uh, there's an, er uh, an area to um, type in some questions. We have a little bit of time. Um, so let me see what you got. First question is from Artie G. Can we use a zoster vaccine in an adult patient who had a history of chicken pox in their childhood? Um, so, so you don't really need to, right? Uh, if this is, uh, well, this is herpetic zoster vaccine in an adult patient. Yes, uh, you know, you can assume that, uh, at least in this country, almost everybody has had chicken pox. And that is the reason why you would have a herpes zoster outbreak as an, uh, as an adult. And so, yes, if you had chicken pox in your childhood, then we do recommend the herpes zoster vaccine if you're over 50 years old. Second question is Ahmed Ali. Uh, if we suspect keratitis is due to herpes, is it better to give or not give an antiviral? So hopefully after um, this talk, uh, the answer is, is clear that it is better to give the antiviral, right? Um, then the question is whether you wanna give a topical antiviral or a systemic antiviral. Um, one of the studies that, one of the uh, findings that the head study came out with is that uh, oral antivirals and topical antivirals are somewhat equivalent. Uh, so a lot of practitioners now are simply dosing oral antivirals to treat uh, just corneal disease, or sometimes doubling up with topicals and orals. But um, if we learned anything from the head study, it says that you don't need to do that. So yes, if you suspect keratitis is, is herpetic, then you should give antivirals. What about preventing recurrences? This is a question from Mohammed Z. A little bit hard for me to answer this because um, I'm not sure if uh, you mean recurrences from zoster disease or simplex disease. Um, but you know, one of the things that I'm not sure if I mentioned is that uh, in zoster uh, disease, you don't get a lot of recurrences, but in simplex disease, you do get a ton of recurrences. Um, so say you have a patient with, with simplex, a history of simplex keratitis today, right? And you, you manage that patient with, uh, say oral antivirals for the, the certain course. Um, uh, and then uh, the keratitis resolves. What should you do about preventing recurrences? And one of the things that uh, the head study came up with is that you should dose this patient with um, an oral antiviral for at least a year um, because their chance of recurrence in that year is, is quite high. And these antiviral medications are quite safe medications. So there's not much of a risk um, to, to just keep these patients on antiviral medications. We didn't go into the, the dosing of the patients today because we only had like an hour. Um, but when you're dosing a patient for an active infection, it's a relatively high dose of uh, antivirals. And then when you're treating it for prevention of recurrence, it's a lower dose. So feel free, if you, if you manage a simplex keratitis patient and you uh, cure it, keep that patient on oral antivirals. The question is how long you keep them on, and that's a bit more controversial, but most people recommend at least six to 12 months. Dr. Uh, P uh, recommend, uh, asks um, percentage of glaucoma. Um, this is a hard question uh, for me to answer, um, but I think you're, say you have a, a simplex or a zoster keratitis, um, I guess the question is, how likely it, is it that this patient is going to get glaucoma? Um, and I think the only reason that they would get glaucoma is if they also develop a uveitis because of this uh, infection. 
uh, and then that changes the trabecular meshwork and causes their pressure to go high. Um, so a, a uveitis from, from uh, any kind of herpetic disease is, is somewhat rare, but if they get that uveitis, then uh, the percentage of glaucoma is much higher. Is a dendritic ulcer contagious? This is a, a great question, um, and the answer is no, it's not thought to be contagious. Um, perhaps it's, it's very possible if you take these scrapings of a dendrite and then inoculate another person's cornea. Um, but uh, besides doing something artificial like that, uh, it's not thought to be spread. Uh, a dendrite is just kind of like a reactivation of the disease, the systemic disease in these nerves. Uh, Rachel B. Uh, says, when should we give steroids in herpetic simplex keratitis? This is a good question. Um, Again, I couldn't get into all the treatments and all the different layers because it's pretty complicated and involved. But um, to answer your question briefly, you should not give steroids in simplex keratitis if the epithelium is broken, uh, right? And so if you have epithelial keratitis and you give steroids without antivirals, the risk of, of creating uh, an infection is, is worse, right? But then if you have stromal involvement, that's usually inflammatory, right? So then you should give steroids unless it's that rare case of uh, direct viral infection of the stroma in which you should give antivirals. So it's tough, right? It's tough and you have to identify what layer. But for your average um, epithelial simplex keratitis, you should give uh, antivirals until the epithelium clears and then consider dosing steroids to prevent scarring. How do you, uh, the question from Ravi M, is how do you manage chronic stromal inflammation? Uh, and the answer is uh, very carefully with steroids. Uh, every patient is a little bit different, right? And the, this is one of the things that we talked about is, is the best thing is to prevent this from happening in the first place. And patients who have epithelial disease, keep them on um, an antiviral regimen so that they don't get this stromal uh, re uh, inflammation or involvement. Um, but you keep them on steroids, uh, sometimes oral steroids and sometimes topical steroids, depending on the severity. Uh, Farouk H asks, um, is there any other cause of neurotrophic keratitis, not herpetic? Uh, and the answer is yes, there is. Anything that damages the corneal nerves uh, will cause neurotrophic keratitis. So any kind of uh, neuropathy, right? You can have um, neurotrophic keratitis from diabetes, um, just like you can have peripheral neuropathy from diabetes. So uh, herpes, which is a viral disease, uh, and diabetes, which can affect the nerves, um, is certainly one, but there's myriad other diseases that affect the corneal nerves, but those are the two most common ones. Um, but you can also have it from, say, something like uh, limbal stem cell disease or any kind of like chronic corneal disease. Uh, Hui uh, asks, in which type of viral keratitis should we add systemic antiviral medication to treatment? Is it essential in all types? And what kind of viral keratitis should we add systemic antiviral medication to treatment? Is it essential in all types? Um, I would say that your first line of therapy is usually systemic or oral antiviral medications. Um, is it essential? You know, for some epithelial disease, some doctors prefer topical treatments. Some doctors prefer oral treatments. Um, but the oral medications are dosed less frequently. You know, it's often just once or twice a day. So the compliance is a lot better than topical treatments. Um, and they're safe medications if your patient has normal kidney function. So I wouldn't hesitate to, to put patients on, on uh, oral medications. Uh, this question is from Anonymous. Uh, we find dilute steroid is very effective when the epithelium is intact. What is your impression? Um, I haven't tried this uh, dilute steroid. Um, haven't tried it. It's an interesting, interesting thought. Next question from Anonymous. How long should your oral or topical antivirals be given for herpetic keratitis? Um, and so this is, this is really dependent on what layer it is and, and the severity of it, right? And so I kind of direct you to um, the textbooks uh, for this, but depends on, on the severity. The dosing of acyclovir and gancyclovir, again, we couldn't really get into that uh, based on time, um, but you can, you can find this. And it, 
it's, I don't like to, to just kind of like spout these numbers in lectures because I find that it's not, it's not really great um, listening to just uh, listening to a certain milligram dosage, but suffice it to say that it's a higher dose in, in uh, well, it's basically a higher dose the more severe the infection is. And it's a higher dose if you're treating active disease versus recurrences. So check it out. Laylee A uh, asks, I have many patients with a, king, a kind of chronic uh, herpetic uveitis that I can't stop the topical steroids in valacyclovir. I don't know what is better to do. That's a tough one. Um, a kind of chronic anterior herpetic uveitis that I can't stop the topical steroids in valacyclovir. I don't know what better to do. Uh, that's, that's really tough. You know, I know, I know that some of these, when, when they become uh, deep in the eye with, with uveitis, uh, then it's tough because the pressure is rising. Is the pressure rising because of the uveitis or is it a steroid response? Um, or is it a combination of both? Um, you have the patient on valacyclovir, which is sometimes the best thing that you can do. Um, but uh, I wish I had a, a, a great answer for you. Uh, Devetta D asks, what is prophylactic dose of systemic valacyclovir to prevent the recurrences? And again, I'll, I'll just ask you to, to look that up um, rather than just reciting the milligrams. Abdul Husini asks, sorry, but related to antivirals, do we use systemic antiviral in adenoviral uh, infection of the eye? So this is a good question. Uh, so I presume you're not talking about herpetic infection, you're just talking about your regular adenoviral conjunctivitis or, or keratitis. Um, and most of the literature says no to do this. At least the, the, the treatment in America is, is against this. I think the reason is because the potential for kind of serious uh, infection or visually, visually limiting disease is, is rare here. So um, uh, we do not usually recommend treating these patients with, with oral antivirals just because it's a kind of like a limiting, rate limiting phenomenon. How long do you prescribe oral acyclovir in recurrent stromal keratitis? Um, this is a great question, and I would say at least a year. Um, and then after a year, um, you assess the patient, uh, and it is kind of like patient dependent on that. But if, it, if it's like a really severe recurrence or the patient is monocular for other reasons and you're really worried about it, then maybe they're on oral antivirals for life. Again, these are, these are relatively low doses when it's just the recurrence rate. Uh, and they're safe drugs um, for the kidneys. So I wouldn't be afraid to keep these patients longer rather than shorter. Ahmed Ali asks, can we give topical antivirals instead of an oral one as a prevention against recurrent viral keratitis? I would, I would say no, nobody really does this. Uh, this is uh, like, again, for recurrence, not talking about active disease, but recurrence. Um, it's not recommended. I think the reason why it's not recommended is because even the good topical virals, antivirals have some uh, ramifications and, and toxicity to the epithelium. So it just seems to be safer to give oral ones. But I guess there's not in the literature, not much in the literature about that. But it's not typically done. When uh, Samantha A asks, when do you introduce topical steroids in the epithelial keratitis? Uh, and the answer is when when the epithelial is when the epithelium is closed, or um, after you have the patient on uh, a high dose of antivirals for several days, you don't want to start the steroids too quickly here. And the only reason you would start steroids in the first place is to prevent scarring. Um, so be careful here. If you if you do want to start steroids while the epithelium is still broken, you have to make make sure that you know, the patient's been on antivirals for long enough that the disease is slowing down. How do you manage neurotrophic keratitis? That's a really hard one, right? And the, the best way to do it is to prevent it from happening in the first place. But <clears throat> heavy lubrication is the answer to that. Uh, topicals um, and then sometimes orals, everything you can do for lubrication. And then sometimes these patients need an amniotic membrane or maybe like a blepharoplasty. Um, uh, to close the eye and, and, and close the ocular surface. On um, uh, D asks, should we decrease the dose of oral antivirals uh, in simplex keratitis when using the oral drug to prevent recurrence? 
Did we decrease the dose of oil in cows when using the oral drug to prevent? Oh, yes. The answer is yes. Yeah, you, you dose at a, at a uh, smaller rate when it's to prevent recurrence than for an active infection. Uh, Byra Bat asks, how long can we give steroids in stromal herpetic keratitis? How long can you give them? I mean, as long as the patient needs it, frankly. Um, some patients, like patients who have corneal transplants, are on topical steroids for, for life. So you give it as long as you, as long as you can. Dr. Kamini P. asks, what is the protocol for cataract surgery in cases of healed herpetic viral keratitis? This is a great question. Um, we talked about the risk of um, LASIK and, uh, and um, uh, corneal cross-linking uh, in patients with a history of herpetic keratitis. For cataract surgery, um, there, is, uh, there is no real, uh, there's thought to be very little risk in an activation of that disease when you're doing cataract surgery. So we don't necessarily recommend putting the patient back on oral antivirals, but some, some surgeons will do that. Um, but it seems to be less of a risk than the uh, corneal conditions that we talked about. Perhaps because the um, incision in the cornea is much smaller. Ahmed Ali asks, if herpetic skin lesions cured without a scar, is this proof that these lesions are due to simplex and not due to zoster? No, I would say no. Most herpetic zoster skin lesions cure without a scar. The only time that they create a scar is if there's a bacterial superinfection and that, that bacteria burrows deeper into uh, the dermis. Uh, Mohammed Z asks, French sources recommend preventative oral antiherpetic medication if there are more than three epithelial recurrences or two stromal recurrences a year. Do you follow similar recommendations in the United States? Oral anti if there are more than three or two stromal recurrences a year. Uh, yes, I would say, I would say yes, and, and we're probably more aggressive than, than that. Uh, two stromal recurrences in one year is kind of a lot, in my opinion, so I probably would have um, prescribed uh, preventative uh, herpetic medication even before. Then. I think, like I said, that these, these um, medications are very safe and, um, and, and we shouldn't really hesitate to use them. All right, maybe we'll do uh, two more questions. Uh, Farouk Husseini asks, um, management of persistent numular keratitis after adenoviral keratitis. Um, Persistent numular keratitis after adenoviral keratitis. So I would say steroids, topical steroids, right? And this is so this you're talking about adenoviral keratitis, um, not herpetic keratitis. Um, but numular keratitis is simply an inflammation um, of uh, the epithelial infection, right? So you treat this with steroids. Um, perhaps if you're if you're worried about the adenoviral keratitis flaring again, um, then maybe you can also give like an oral antiviral on top of that while you give topical steroids just so you, you have um, less concern about the virus flaring up. And then maybe we'll do the last question. Um, uh, let's do it from FISA. Aside from herpetic eye disease story, uh, study, uh, what resources would you recommend to read further on treatment and doses for herpetic keratitis? That's a great question. I love um, up to date is a website. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a somewhat expensive website that you need to subscribe for. Um, but if you're in like a teaching setting, you can get uh, this subscription for it. Up to date is, uh, pardon the pun, but the most up to date reference that we have, uh, at least from the American uh, studies, about what we recommend treatment for. And then there's a textbook that um, is holding this computer up right now. It's called Cornea, um, and it's by uh, Barry Kratchmer, um, by Mosby. Uh, uh, printing, uh, that I think is great and kind of like the Bible of, of cornea text. All right, so I think that will do it for me, but I appreciate everybody tuning in and all the good questions. I'm sorry I couldn't answer them all. Um, but you have my email uh, address on the first slide. That if you want to email me these questions, I'd be happy to respond to you guys. But thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, um, and we'll see you around.